There are three ways you can give to support the love-focused, culture-changing, ever-evolving, community-building, Jesus-inspired work of the village. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979, 404-998-8979, or you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com slash give, thevillageatlanta.com slash give, or you can mail a check to The Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Now let's get ready to get better so that we can do better so that we can be better. Let's have church. Well, as a church, we have decided to do something radical. I know that's not a big surprise. We have decided to deal with God's interest in rest, earth shattering. The idea of rest contradicts our hustle bustle, success focused culture, but the Bible teaches us that rest, rest, Genuine rest matters. It really matters. When we open the Bible, it starts with a beautiful poem about the beginnings of human history, and the poem unfolds through Genesis 1 using a metaphor of six days, and we're familiar with it. Then Genesis 2, the poem continues with a day of rest. You remember this. Look on the screen. Genesis 2, 3, God blessed the seventh day, and he made it special because on that day, God rested from his work. God rested from his work. Beautiful picture of what God is going to set up for each of us. In modern culture, sleep and rest are often undervalued, but when we revisit the Jewish creation story, we are reminded that God doesn't undervalue rest. God puts a priority on it. As we fast forward through the Jewish story of human history, children are born, families grow into nations where ideas about good and evil are codified into Law, you you know the Ten Commandments. Uh, The Jewish people believed that it was given to them by the very hand of God. These commandments became the foundation of their civilization. And most of the commandments, you know, are very short. Don't steal, don't kill, don't lie. But two two of the commandments are bigger, longer, and one is particularly long, and that's the fourth commandment. And you know what it's about? It's about the importance of resting, of resting. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember that the Sabbath day belongs to me, God says. You have six days when you can do your work, but the seventh day of each week belongs to me, your God. No one is to work on that day, not you, your children, your slaves, your animals, or the foreigners who live in your towns. In six days, I made the sky, the earth, the oceans, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That's why I made the Sabbath a special day that belongs to me. I think it's interesting that people who had come out of slavery, where they were treated as property, where they literally worked seven days a week and were on the clock 24 hours a day, they had to be taught right away when they were beginning this journey, right away God had to teach them, you're important, you matter. One day a week you rest. You just rest. You are not a machine. You're not property. You're not somebody that has to ring the work bell every single day. You're important to me. Remember how the story read in in Genesis about creation. I rested. If I rest, it's important for you to rest. There are quite a few things that make the village unique. Uh, You could probably name 10 things that make us unique. But one of the things that makes us unique is at least once a year, We talk about rest. We believe it's that important. We believe that God values rest. As the Bible story continues to unfold, the commandments to rest was expanded into long list. This became a problem. They took a simple commandment, rest, and they said, well, what does rest mean? And they started trying to to break it down and add more things to it until it became unmanageable. Jesus came and Jesus said, no, that's a misunderstanding. But he never took away the idea that you're supposed to rest one day a week. God honors rest. Rest helps us live happier, healthier lives. Anne Lamott's one of my favorite writers. She's a popular progressive Christian author. She's done a TED Talk, which is worth watching, about the 12 lessons that she has learned from her quirky approach to life. Anne Lamott. This was one I love. She said, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes 
including you. Haven't you found that that's true when the computer's not working, the refrigerator's not working, the cable TV's not working, direct TV's not working? What do you do? First thing, unplug it and then plug it back. That's the idea of rest. Now, at least once a year, over the last three years, at least once a year at the village, I teach about rest and I teach about sleep. Some of y'all practice the sleep part actually every Sunday at the village, and I appreciate, I appreciate y'all keeping the snoring down, but I know that many of you do that. When I do this, I don't only approach it from a spiritual perspective, which we are going to have a spiritual application I want you to get, but I share with you what scientists who research sleep are beginning to understand, and it is mind-boggling. It is amazing what science is teaching us about sleep. Over the course of human history, sleep has baffled people. It's strange, isn't it, that we need to spend at least a third of every day sleeping in order to survive and be our very best selves. When we are sleep deprived, our sanity and our ability to get things done effectively starts to slip. If you go long enough without sleep, you'll begin to hallucinate and it will ultimately kill you. So getting the right amount of sleep at all times isn't about being lazy or unproductive. We certainly aren't for being lazy or unproductive. It matters as much as drinking water and eating good food. Philosophers and scientists have theories about sleep that were unprovable until recent years, but now the research is happening just like this. Only in our current lifetimes have we begun to understand why we sleep and what we really gain from having enough sleep or what we lose by not having enough sleep. Last summer, for several weeks, we talked about happiness. You remember that's one of my favorite series we've ever done, and what are really the things that lead to happiness in our lives as understood by scientists today and confirmed by Scripture. We looked and said, yeah, the Bible was saying many of these same things. One of the things that we talked about was the importance for healthy rest. The most shocking thing I learned about the importance of sleep came from a circadian neuroscientist. I had never read this guy before, but he, he studies sleep cycles of the brain. His name was Dr. Russell Foster, and maybe you remember this quote. He said this, sleep is the single most important behavioral experience that we have in life. That was a huge statement. And the more I understand about what happens when we sleep and the damage we do to ourselves when we don't get enough sleep, the more I understand the importance of that quote. According to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes, a chronic lack of sleep or getting poor quality sleep increases the risk of disorders including high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, and obesity. In addition to our physical health, sleep impacts our uh, psychological health. Our ability to learn new things, stunning to me, our ability to learn new things drops by 40% when we aren't getting enough sleep. Here's what we know about sleep. And what I want to do is I want to talk to you about kind of my recent learnings about what happens when we're asleep. Then I want to talk to you about some laws of sleep that we better follow. And then I want to hit with three quick uh, applications that includes a spiritual application that I think will be helpful. All right? So first, let me, let me share with you what I'm learning about sleep. There are two types of sleep. You may want to remember this. REM is not only a great rock band, it also stands for rapid eye movement, which is the deepest level of sleep. And we're going to talk about REM sleep. And then there's non-REM sleep, and non-REM sleep happens in three stages. And in each of these stages, our brain waves and neurological activities change, and there's, there's important things that are happening in non-REM sleep and REM sleep. I know it's a little overwhelming, but I want you to stay with me. We cycle through the three non-REM stages before we get to the REM sleep, all right? So let me talk about these three non-rapid eye movement stages. The first we'll call simply stage one. In stage one, we go through a transition from being awake to being asleep. It's a light level of sleep where our heartbeat, our eye movements, and our breathing begins to slow down. During that first stage, our muscles begin to relax. You know the feeling that I'm talking about when you get a sense that you're falling and suddenly you jerk. Y'all all have done that? That's a part of stage one or phase one of sleep, stage one of sleep. When that happens, you're in stage one. Then you move into stage two. This happens every night. This happens every night. Stage two is a deeper level of sleep, but it's still considered very light. You're still just very much at the edge of sleep. 
In stage two, things that happen in stage one happen a little bit more. Your breathing slows down more. Your heartbeat begins to relax and slow down. Your muscles even become more relaxed. In stage two, your body temperature drops and your eyes stop moving under your eyelids completely. Your brain activity slows down as, as, as well, but there are bursts of electrical activity that happens in your brain, but it's happening in this cooling down body that's just getting deeper and deeper into sleep. Then there's stage three. From stage two, you're gonna drift into stage three and it's a much deeper level. And each time we cycle into stage three during a night time, each time you, you cycle into stage three, it gets shorter and shorter throughout the night. So stage three becomes a smaller amount of time. In stage three, that's when we're the hardest to wake up. You know, when you just can't wake somebody up, that's they're in stage three. Then you get into stage four and stage four happens about every 90 minutes in the night, and that's the REM stage of sleep. Have y'all heard of REM, rapid eye movement sleep? Everybody's heard of that, right? I know some of y'all know have heard of that. In REM stage, not only do your eyes start to dart around under your eyelids, that's a crazy thing. You're in one of the, the, the most important levels of sleep, but your eyes under your eyelids are just going all different directions. That's kind of a crazy thing. Um, your brain activity returns to a state that's very similar to when you're wide awake. So your brain suddenly starts firing like crazy. And while in the first three stages, things start slowing down, but in the fourth stage, things speed up. Even your breath speeds up during this REM stage. Your heart rate, your blood pressure goes up as well. It's the stage when you dream the most, but at the same time, your muscles are paralyzed during this stage. Scientists believe that when we dream, our mind is working to make sense of what's working in our lives and how memories and learning get solidified in our brain. Students studying to pass exams remember better and they get higher test scores after going through several cycles of sleep that include REM activity. REM activity is where the brain really heals. I didn't know this, but scientists tell us we all dream, but not everyone remembers their dreams. How many of you remember dreams pretty vividly? Let me, this was shocking to me. Listen to this. Remembering dreams can indicate that you're not getting enough sleep. I, I didn't know that. I, did, I, I thought that you guys were getting deep sleep, and I was not getting deep sleep because I don't remember hardly ever a dream. But the science is telling us that if you are remembering your dreams, that could be an indicator that you're not getting enough sleep. Okay, that's a little bit about how sleep works. This is the first time I've ever looked at actually the the stages of how sleep happens during the night and how you keep cycling these stages and how important it is to get into that REM sleep for your brain to do the healing that needs to take place. Now, there's seven facts that I want you to get about sleep that you can't, you can think that you can do it differently, but it's not going to work for you. These are seven things science says is absolutely true. And we've talked about these before, but I want you to see them again. Every human needs more than seven hours of sleep every night. Every human needs more than seven hours of sleep a night. Remember how I made a big deal about Chuck Johnson last week, the CPA that sometimes has to work 20 hours a day? It will eventually take its toll on him. It, as strong as he is, it will eventually take its toll on him. Every human, science says, we don't care, we don't care. Every human needs seven hours of sleep. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention based here in Atlanta says adults need somewhere between seven and 10 hours of sleep each night. If you're getting less than seven hours of sleep each night, your cognitive ability starts slipping. Your memory suffers. Creativity becomes a struggle. Your ability to learn is impaired and your work performance suffers. If you're getting less than five hours of sleep each night, you begin to decline physically. If you have high blood pressure, uh, find yourself frequently getting sick or gaining weight. If your libido is going down, if you're experiencing mood swings, paranoia, depression, it could be that you're not getting as much sleep as your mind and body needs. Every night we sleep fewer than seven hours of sleep, we increase our risk of diabetes, stroke, dementia, and some cancers. Now, I shared this chart last year, and this was, again, very helpful to me. This is what science is saying that we need. Newborn from zero to three months old, they need to sleep 14 to 17 hours a day. And some of you remember when your babies were little, and that's what they do. They need to just do that. Infants from 4 to 11 months old, they still need to sleep 12 to 15 hours a day. Toddlers, 1 to 2 years old, 11 to 14 hours a day. 
preschoolers from three to five years old, 10 to 13 hours. And I see sometimes parents who say, yeah, we let little Johnny stay up with us till 11 o'clock and then he's up at seven. It'll take its toll on little Johnny if he is a preschooler, three to five, he needs 10 to 13 hours. School-age children from six to 13 need nine to 11 hours of sleep. Teenagers from 14 to 17 years old need eight to 10 hours of sleep. Younger adults need seven to nine hours of sleep. Adults between 26 and 64 need seven to nine hours of sleep. Older adults, 65 and up, seven to eight hours of sleep. That's the science, just want you to know. Second law about sleep is this, being able to fall asleep anywhere at any time is a warning sign indicating that you're not getting enough sleep. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you are, have your whole life, you've been able to go to sleep anywhere, anytime? Me too. I thought that was a good thing. My dad does that. And, and I always thought, I, you, you see me, my dad, my son, Ray, my son, Ethan, at the airport. And if there's a 10 minutes that before we get on the plane, all four of us will be sitting in our chairs and we will be sound asleep. We've always told people, because we have clear consciences and we can just do that. Y'all can't, those other, you know, because y'all have stuff on y'all's conscience that bothers you. I thought that was a good thing, but research says otherwise. Research says if you're falling asleep like that in the daytime, it's not good. Rebecca Robbins is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Population Health at NYU. She said this, falling asleep instantly anywhere, anytime is a sign that you're not getting enough sleep and you're falling into micro sleeps or mini sleep episodes, it means your body is so exhausted that whenever it has a moment, it's going to try to repay its sleep debt. That was a little, I mean, it's kind of registering for me. I, I don't know that I should be that tired that I just can sleep. We used to joke, my dad driving would go sleep at a red light. It's like, dad, you know, don't do that. But if he was stopped, he would go to sleep, not good. Third thing, we cannot learn to live on less sleep. We like to think we can. I'm gonna train myself to live on five hours sleep a night. So many important things happen in our mind and body when we go through the four stages of sleep. It is critically important to our health and our brains. Unless you're getting more than seven hours of sleep each night, you lose many of the health benefits that are important. Here's one that y'all, we all can relate to. Heavy snoring is a warning sign. According to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, 30% of the population experiences sleep apnea. And the primary sign is loud, raucous snores interrupted by pauses in breathing, and it can lead to heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, um, uh, by saying that, fibrillation, asthma, high blood pressure, glaucoma, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, and cognitive and behavioral disorders. But there's good news. Once diagnosed, a CPAP machine solves most of the problems that grow out of sleep apnea. Curious how many sleep with a sleep apnea machine? Some, some people here, okay, I've, my dad does too. He says, really wonderful. Um, show of hands, how many other either snore badly or sleep with somebody who snores badly? Can I see your hands? Okay, all right, That's, I get it. Jane and I had just gotten married and according to her, I had snored loudly all night. She even said her fear was that one of these nights I might stop breathing. I said, why is that, because of sleep apnea? She said, no, if you keep me awake again, I'm gonna choke you to death. That's why <laughs> you may stop breathing. So uh, I snore very, very loudly and I'm embarrassed by it and I wish that I didn't. And a CPAP machine may be the, may be the thing because it's, um, I was with Ethan, Rachel and Ray this past week in a, in a setting where um, I could just relax for a few minutes and I drifted off to sleep. And I'm sitting in like a waiting room area and in my mind, I just drifted off to sleep for a few minutes, but they said, no, you drift off to sleep and you snored when you're in that wedding room area. It's like, God, that's horrible. That is a horrible thing. Let me tell you another law. Drinking alcohol before bed hurts more than it helps. How many have thought if I can just, if I just take me a drink, it's gonna help me sleep? So many people think that, but the truth is it doesn't. Alcohol, especially in excess, keeps us locked mostly in the first stages of sleep. It will not let you get to the REM stage that you need for complete recovery. You may still experience the REM stage, but not nearly as long or as deep as you need to be in that stage to have real health. Number six, this was interesting. Lying in bed trying to fall asleep isn't a good way to get sleep when you're not sleepy. How many of you have laid in bed and said, oh, I can't go to sleep, I'm just laying here and I'm trying to think, how can I go to sleep? And I'm trying to count sheep, I'm trying to do crazy things, just trying to relax. Science says, sleep researchers advise dedicating your beds for sleep and if you can't sleep, get up 
and do some activity that's kind of a easy activity. They said folding clothes or folding socks or just something that's just with light lights on so it's kind of just barely you know, able to see, but just do something like that that's not going to get your heart racing and then get back in the bed when you get sleepy. Don't just lay in the bed if you're not able to sleep. And finally, they say this, having a consistent sleep schedule matters. And I know some of you, your schedules are crazy and it doesn't work, but I'm telling you it's important. Our minds and our bodies develop circadian rhythms. By developing a consistent routine, our brains begin to release the right chemicals in our bodies at exactly the right time to let us get into proper sleep patterns that will make our lives better. Now, I wanna give you three closing thoughts, all right? I know you think that's way more about sleep than I ever wanted to learn, but it's important. It's important, and I want us all to be the healthiest. At the village, we care more about that, that we're all healthy. We have a healthy understanding of God, a healthy understanding of ourselves, and we are doing things in the best way possible to live the very best lives possible. Remember, we want to get better so we can do better so we can be better. So here's the last three thoughts I want to close with. By design, get this, sleep is as necessary for humans as food, water, or oxygen. If you think you can get by without very much sleep or you cannot protect your sleep time, you're making a mistake. Caribou Coffee, uh, they had a logo a few years ago that said, life is short, stay awake for it. And that's a cute logo, and I know what they're saying. Don't, don't sleep your life away, but don't misinterpret that. Don't misinterpret that and think that they are saying sleep is not important. It is very, very important. Um, I love Steve Harvey. Uh, Jane and I actually were on Family Feud several years ago, and it, it was uh, it, the cool thing about being on Family Feud was between the, ep- between the takes, when you're waiting to go on, watching Steve Harvey do comedy with a crowd was one of the, I mean, it was amazing how funny he was. And so I love him. He's probably the busiest guy in show business. I've never seen anything, uh, anybody do more than him. Family Feud, Little Big Shots, talk show Steve Harvey, uh, used to do Showtime at the Apollo. He also has a daily radio show. Now, a year ago, he was just riffing on his radio show one morning, and he said success, he was talking about success, and he said it's not comfortable. It's very uncomfortable. You got to get comfortable being uncomfortable if you want to be successful. And every, I'm just nodding my head. That makes sense. But then he said this. He said, talking about how if you want to be successful, you got to get uncomfortable. And he said, rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. That's a third of your life. There ain't but 24 hours in a day. You cannot be asleep eight hours a day. And then he quoted this verse from the Bible, which is in the Bible, Proverbs 6, 10 and 11, asleep. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So Steve was saying, hey, you guys want to sleep your life away? I'm telling you, you can't be successful sleeping your life away. I get the point. But in putting down sleep, people came out of the woodworks saying, Steve, the science says that that's wrong. And Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, who were two of the five richest guys in the world, they could buy Steve Harvey over a thousand times. I mean, they did, they're so huge. They had just done an interview with Charlie Rose where they said, busy is the new stupid. And I thought you might enjoy the interview. Look at this. I also remember Warren showing me his calendar and, oh, I love uh, oh, you know, I, love I had every minute packed and yeah. I thought that was the only way you could do things. And, no. you know, the fact that he uh, yeah. is so careful about his Can I time. show this to the audience? <laughs> yeah. This, you know, he has days. <laughs> that there's nothing on. That there's nothing on. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, show. Some of the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> and well, this is October. It's very high tech. Be back. careful. No, you, you might yeah. not understand. I'm going to hold I'm not going to show the thing. But this is the week of uh, April, of which there are only three entries for a week. <laughs> yeah, there'll be four maybe by April. <laughs> File tax. So for, that yeah. taught you what? To, to, not to crowd yourself too much and give yourself that time you, to read and think and... Right, that you up up control up. your time and that sitting and thinking uh, may be a much higher priority than a normal CEO who, you know, there's all this demand and you feel like you need to go and see all these people. Uh, it's not a proxy of your seriousness that you filled every minute in your schedule. 
And people uh, are going to want to want your time. Yeah, the and it's the is, only thing you can't buy. I mean, yeah. I buy anything I want, the, 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 basically, but I can't buy time. Uh, and, and so to have time is the most precious it's, thing you can have. It, I better be careful with it. Yeah. I, 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 there's no way I will be able to buy more time. So we all have 24. I thought it was very interesting. And they talk also about sleep and the importance of sleep. I just thought it was really, really good. I then ran across this. The greatest basketball player of this generation, I think most would agree of this generation, is LeBron James. Forbes magazine interviewed him, and he said he sleeps 12 hours a night. 12 hours a night. Now, I know we're not exercising like LeBron, right? We're not running around like LeBron. But it's still just getting you to see... You don't have to be working 20 hours a day. You don't need to keep that kind of pace. Sleep, seven to nine hours be very helpful. Here's the second thing I want to say, and this is the spiritual application. Sleep can be more than just a physical benefit. It also is a serious spiritual practice. You probably never thought of this before, but sleep is distinctly spiritual. We see this in the Psalms, and then we see it in the life of Jesus for sure. Psalm 3 is the first psalm in the Bible with a title attached to it. And this goes all the way back to the Hebrew Old Testament. This title is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So David is being hunted down by his own son. And David writes this psalm, Psalm 3, verses 5 and 6. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surrounded me on every side. David said, because I trust God, I can go to sleep because I know it's going to be okay. Psalm 4.8 says this, in peace, I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Sleep is saying something. David is making sleep an act of faith in in the Lord's protection. Enemies may surround him. They may want to destroy him, but he sleeps because he knows the Lord sustains him and the Lord guards him. Then there's a cool story from the gospels. This scene is from Mark chapter four. Jesus and the disciples are out in a boat in the middle of the night when a terrible storm comes up. And look at Mark 4, 37. A fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. So this is serious. The waves are so intense, they're breaking into the boat and and the water is coming onto the boat, it's crazy. The disciples are terrified. This is a shipwreck in, in the works, but where is Jesus? And I love this, Mark 4, 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him shouting, teacher, teacher, don't you care that we're gonna drown? He's in the stern of the boat, asleep. He wakes up, commands the storm to quiet. Of course, the disciples are awed by that. I'm awed by the fact that he was asleep in the middle of the boat when water was coming in the sides. But he could trust. Jesus slept for the same reason David did. He knew God was good. Didn't mean everything was going to work out perfectly. It led, he died, I mean, at the hands of, of, of people that hated him. But he knew that God was in control. And he could sleep. Playing off the the caribou coffee slogan, life is short, stay awake for it. I want to say, if you're a person of faith, life is short. Get some sleep. Rest in knowing that God is good. God is good. And that's why we wanted to talk about rest today. We talked about stress last week, good stress, work under it. It's important. Work, work, work. We want you to work in a healthy way. And then we want you to know that rest is important too. And we want you to rest well. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? God, thank you. Thank you for letting us be a little bit outside the box. Thank you for allowing us to see the importance of taking time to rest. For spending time with our families. Lord, I just think about so many of our people who work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Then they they are handling stuff on Saturdays for their family, and then they turn around on Sundays and they're up here at seven in the morning and they're working five, six, seven hours here. It just seems like a, a kind thing to say, take a breath, take a step back, relax. We're gonna be okay. Help this become something very healthy for our church. 
Help it make sense to all of us. Thank you for teaching us about rest. May we apply it in our lives and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.